Welcome to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast. For anyone who thinks they've heard a study that says chocolate is good for your health and want to know if it's really true, we did that in a previous podcast, so you can go back and figure it out. I'm Matt Fox, Professor of Epidemiology and Global Health. I'm here with Don Thea and Chris Gill, also from the Department of Global Health. And we are here in the Boston University Godly Studio, as always. Uh, before we get started, we want to take a second to remind you about Population Health Exchange, the Boston University School of Public Health's research hub for lifelong learning. Find out more at www.pophealth.com. Ex.org. That's www.pophealthex.org, where you'll find this podcast as well as many other population health learning programs and tools. Uh, and as a reminder, we would love it if you would go ahead and rate us on iTunes. We don't yet have any ratings. We have uh, lots of, of five stars, but I think that's mostly me and Don and Chris and our, and our th- yeah, and our 12 other family members. And our 12 other family members. Uh, so we really appreciate it. That would help other people find us. And now we will uh, start the show. So today in our first segment, our Journal Club segment, we are going to look into whether or not exercise increases academic achievement. And I will say that this is our first ever uh, listener-generated topic. In the second part of the podcast, in our deep dive segment, we're going to talk about whether observational studies can, in fact, get at causation, another listener-derived topic, different listeners. And then in our third segment, our amazing and amusing, we will get into things that just made us smile, and Chris will tell us about the many uses of slime. So before we get into it... Today I'm talking about dirty birds. Okay, don't even want to know. Uh, before we get into it, so we actually have some some listener feedback. Uh, no, that I wanted really? To, we had some actual listener feedback, uh, which I wanted to, to uh, raise, which I'm only going to get into two of the points because the third point will get us into our deep dive segment. But the two points that I wanted to raise... These come from Tim Lash, a, a, a well-known a epidemiologist. Real epidemiologist. To, uh, he's... He's a real epidemiologist. He's a he is, uh, and uh, who uh, has been listening to the podcast, uh, and he made he noted on a couple of points. So I, I'll only read a couple of them. Which is, uh, so he says on number six, which is the one that we did where we looked at the relationship between air pollution and uh, uh, mortality. Uh, he was reacting to a point that we made about banning uh, industry-sponsored research, and he said he thinks that would be a, a bit of a disaster uh, because industry is obliged by regular regulators to conduct safety and efficacy studies, so why would we want to keep those out of the evidence-based? And he uh, notes that a more nuanced model is the ENCEPP model for post-marketing safety studies of pharmaceuticals. I don't know anything about that. I don't know if you do, Chris, but anyway, that is something we might consider. Uh, and then on on number five, which uh, oh sorry, I may have gotten this backwards. Sorry, I, I, the, that was not the uh, air pollution study. That was the um, that was the uh, the other study. The other study. We'll right, go let's with that. Keep going. Number five was the <laughs> was the air pollution study. There we go. Uh, in which we raised, I think I specifically raised uh, the issue uh, of of. Um, uh, the uh, various forms of, of potential sources of bias, uh, and he just wanted to, he wanted to point out that many of those sources of bias have actually been addressed in the uh, the totality of the evidence base. Uh, and I specifically raised the possibility that exposure misclassification may have bias towards the null. I said uh, that they may not have had a great measure of their exposure, and therefore that would tend to bias towards no effect. Uh, and I think that, uh, as Tim points out, that in uh, ecologic studies, uh, that actually can bias away from the null, something that I hadn't really realized. So, so he was not one of our five-star reviewers. <laughs> uh, no, he said he, he gave positive feedback, said he really enjoyed it and was finds it amusing. Well, but, uh, we don't no, I would classify that right. as a three or four star review. Okay, you're gonna give that a you're gonna you're gonna go I'm just, online I'm just for him from what he's what he's putting down. There you go. All right, all right. So let's get into it. Let's get into segment one. So for for segment one, as I said, this is our first listener uh, suggested topic. It came from a, a, a buddy of mine who uh, works in education and was specifically interested in knowing whether or not. Uh, the, w- was interested in the uh, studies that have come out on the relationship between uh, exercise and uh, educational attainment. Uh, so this particular study that we're going to look at, the lead author is Robert Rauner, and the study was titled, Evidence that Aerobic Fitness is More Salient Than Weight Status in Predicting Standardized Math and Reading Outcomes in 4th through 8th through Grade Students. And it was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, so I, this is a journal that we would 
we would come across uh, in our, our health world, and this is obviously a health-related study, even though it's not a directly a health study. It wasn't a new study, so because it, it came uh, by request. It, this one came out in 2013, so I don't have a lot of headlines, but it did get a lot of uh, publication, a lot, a lot of uh, attention in the, the New York Times, who published an article called How Physical Fitness May Promote School Success, and they seem to uh, take this study to be a, they really seem to like it. So, Don, can you uh, can you get us started and, and talk about what this study found and um, specifically tell us whether or not we should be running an obstacle course before we do the podcast each time? Yeah, um, I, I was really pretty intrigued by this study. Um, and, and the basic premise that aerobic exercise affects your um, intellectual attainment. So I did a little bit of, um, of looking beforehand, and I actually came up with a number of studies. Yeah, yeah, there's that, quite a bit out there. That really was, was interesting, not necessarily in terms of other studies that have looked at the same thing, but studies that have looked at actual brain anatomy. Yep, yep. And I found one that says um, basal ganglia volume is associated with aerobic fitness in pre-adolescent children. Basal ganglia volume. Right, so this, this is a part, a deep part of the brain that is associated with a number of cognitive um, functions, cognition, planning, decision-making, motivation, reinforcement, and reward perception. This is part of the, the, part of the brain called the striatum. Mm. So there's that plus a handful of other studies that where they used MRI and various different things, and they showed that actual aerobic conditioning in pre-adolescence does have a measurable effect on the brain. Effect. We're, we're convinced these are effects, not associations? Yeah. You sure? No. Okay. In any event, there was, there's, some, there's some anatomical <laughs> basis for this. So th what these guys um, um, said in their study is, uh, in an attempt to rationalize increased school funding for physical fitness programs... Wow. They sought to show that fitness directly affects academic performance, as has been indicated in other cohort studies. Um, and what they did is they took advantage of a, of a situation in Nebraska where um, there are um, programs that are, um, are, are put into place um, every year by school-aged children, um, the series of uh, exercises and, and testing. And uh, the, the testing uh, modality is something called, I think it's PACER. Is the, PACER. the PACER. We're going to get into the PACER. Yeah, I've never had any experience with that, so maybe my, you can describe what actually it is. I can tell you about the is. PACER because my kids come home and complain about it oh, every sure. time my they kids have do to it too. do it. Yeah. Uh, essentially, you got to run back and forth. And they measure how much, what, how, how many back and forth trips you can do before you just many, like, no, no, drop. No, 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 no. You, you do it. To the floor uh, and you have to time. run between the lengths of, of whatever it is, I forget the distance, before a beep goes off, and the beep gets successively shorter. I so see. you've got to keep going until twice you are not able to beat the pacer. Oh, I see. All right. So in any event, they do that on a, on a yearly it. basis with every grade level, and they, and they um, measure it, and they put it into a database, and they also do standardized testings, uh, testing every year on the same cohort of children. So here's this database that... Um, these researchers um, went into and tried to um, look for an association between aerobic fitness, as measured by the results of this PACER test, and both math and reading tests. So they abstracted the academic and fitness records from 37 elementary and 10 middle schools in a large city in Nebraska. The primary outcome were, the, as I said, the results for uh, um, this standardized test in math and reading, um, and the raw scores were converted to scaled scores, um, and they were not comparable across grades. And scaled scores really are just a curve. So at every school level, they... Uh, the, the, Cur the, the Curves are the way that I made it through high school. <laughs> yeah. The uh, tests were, um, were uh, um, measured according to those, to expressed according to those um, curved curve results. Um, and then they dichotomized the test results to pass-fail. Um, so they lost a lot of information in terms of, um, of, of, of that information. You're suggesting there was dichotomania? Could be. Uh -huh. Could be. Uh -huh. So they enrolled about 11,700 students with complete data. They collected a bunch of school-level data, also because these kids are, in essence, in clusters that have some homogeneity. So there will be bad schools and good schools, bad teachers, good teachers. So there are sort of environmental factors that, in the analysis, they had to control for. Um, and they found that 69% of the students were fit by these criteria, and 76% of the students got a passing grade on the various tests. Um, they did the usual univariate comparisons and showed that some interesting differences um, there were differences My in fitness, day. differences in the number of students who were enrolled in a lunch, um, a lunch school, school lunch program, indicating that they were of lower socioeconomic status. Um, and they found differences in BMI also. 
So when they um, they did the comparison, they found that thirty of the of the fit children, forty four percent of them were members were ha- were part of these school lunch programs, and sixty percent had elevated um, BMI. Whereas the unfit group, sixty. Uh, 56% of them were part of the lunch programs, and 78% had an elevated BMI. So there were some baseline differences between the fit and the unfit group. As you would imagine, high BMI in the unfit group sort of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, looked at um, some covariates in their analysis, BMI percentile, um, whether they were a member of this um, free and reduced lunch um, group, sex, ethnicity, grade level, and school type. Um, now, the results were, were interesting because they found that, in fact, um, aerobic fitness did, in their analysis, correlate with um, um, the odds of passing a ma- the math and reading test. So in those students who did not ha- were not part of the lunch program, i.e. the higher socioeconomic status students, um, there was a, a 2.4 and 2.23 um, odds ratio of uh, passing the test if you were aerobically fit. And they found the same effect among students who were part of the lunch program, um, except the effect was diminished. It was 1.68, 1.56. Um, so, and, 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 you know, and... So what's the take-home message? So the, take, the take-home message, uh, according to these guys, are that um, aerobic fitness makes you a better student. So and they claim. That, and that seems to be the, the claim that they make. I mean, they do specifically use the word effect, they're not saying just association here. They're saying effect. Right. Before I before I switch over to Chris to get his take on here, what what was the what would you how would you describe the study design? What was the? I mean, this was this wasn't longitudinal data. No, no, there's a cross sectional. This study. is this was cross sectional right. data. So right. this is not. So it's like one point in time. One point in time. Nobody's being followed up. They're not changing anybody's fitness levels and seeing what it does. This is purely cross sectional. All right, Chris. So so what was your take on this study? Mm. So I know that in the middle segment, we're going to talk about the, the challenges of, of inferring causality. Yep. And um, so this is, a, this is a great test case to it sort of set up that. Sure is. Um, it's as if somebody was thinking ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you continue to amaze me ah. on a regular basis. And it's not just here. Who could be thinking ahead? Was that, uh, would that be you, Matt? That would not be you guys. It's not just your fashion. <laughs> it goes so far beyond that. Anyway. You know, um, we just show up here. You know that. I, you know, there, there is a, 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 an enormous amount of published epidemiologic data that one sees in the, in, in the popular press um, that immediately annoys me. And this falls into that category of this immediately annoys me because I, I look at the study design and I think, okay, they're, they're regressing these two different effects. You've got... Regressing meaning what? You're, well, you're doing a cross tab. You're, you're, you're comparing the relationship between two yeah. different phenomena. Yeah. So like you've got you know, high, high fitness versus low fitness and high academic achieving, passing the test versus failing the test. So that's the two by two. Fitness, yes, no. Pass test, yes, no. Yep. And so I say, you know, I, I think, okay, without even looking at the data... How could those be confounded? And so, you know, you say that, well, there, there's a number of different hypotheses being tested here. One is that fitness leads to a change in brain function that leads to a superior academic performance. Okay. So this the, is what Don was talking ganglia, about. The basal right. ganglia, right? Or, or other things going on. Yep. And it's possibly true. A hypothesis number two is that there is a confounder that creates a relationship that is linked to those two outcomes that is itself causal. So there's some factor that's causing you to exercise more and to do better. Right. And so I mean I say, say you know, what do what you know, what kinds of things could that be? And I'm saying like, well, supposing you came from a, a wealthier family with more resources and um, or, you know, who might also have better parenting skills and are the kinds of people who are going to not only sign your kid up for youth soccer when they're five, but also put them into accelerated programs in math and reading and reach them at the bedtime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you suddenly think, well, maybe, you know, better fitness is not just a coincidence. It's because of better resources of the, of the, of the, of the house, yep. the household, the yep. family. And exactly the same thing could apply to academic status. In fact, we know this is true because these two behaviors are collinear in almost every cool set, the school setting. And so I would say I can't tell whether hypothesis number one or hypothesis number two is going to be correct because I know that this relationship has an alternative explanation which would be devilishly difficult to disentangle. Well, and, and, well, and why devilishly difficult to entangle in this study or in general? Well, because I can't, I can't tell what the... I can't say, based on these data, I now believe okay, more than I did data. before yep. that 
there is a causal relationship between academic performance um, and uh, yeah, of exercise fitness. upon academic performance, or the reverse, or that there's a confederate. I have no way of knowing which of those of those those two possibilities is correct. And so, without even looking yeah. at the data, I'm kind of like, you know, I don't. Since I, I, I will, I'm not going to be able at the end of the day to to conclude anything new about it with confidence. It just sort of like rolls off me like water off a duck. I'm just like, I don't know what this tells me that is going to convince me of anything. Really? Yes, really. Because that that sounds particularly depressing. <laughs> it's well, it's harsh. I mean, I, I I don't get me wrong. I share your view of the this particular study. Uh, you started off by saying that uh, it, you know, socioeconomic status is the first thing that comes to mind. They accounted for socioeconomic status in theory. To a degree. In theory, right? They had one simple measure, which was whether or not you were on uh, uh, reduced school lunch. Is that what it was? Basically free or reduced free lunch. Free or reduced lunch. Which, which is, is a proxy for which is socioeconomic status. Low, lack, yeah, low resources of the, house, of the household. Yeah, which is so, so they did account for this a little bit. I think the problem there is that it's a, it's a, very simplistic measure and presumably leaves a lot of that, what we refer to as residual confounding, meaning confounding left over mm-hmm. after you, <laughs> you know, use this one measure. There's a, probably a lot of other things going on. I mean, the right. other thing that it sort of pops into my head is, uh, and this could be based on personal experience, but, you know, if you have a kid who is, uh, shall we say, a little bit lazy uh, and doesn't really want to do the pacer very well. They're not going to try very hard. They might also uh, be the kind of kid who doesn't want to study the kind of school. Who is perfectly good at, at academics but doesn't try their hardest. I can Sorry, relate, mom. I, I can relate to that. Sorry, mom. And so there's the third hypothesis, right, that, that, that these things are both markers of the person rather than a causal relationship. Yep. But I don't think, Chris, I don't think that, and we'll get into this in the second segment, that means that you couldn't do a better version of this study. I just think this was a very simple study that it was a cross-sectional in nature. There was... There wasn't a well-defined hypothesis for how, you know, it sort of exercise correlates with uh, a particular result on a test. And they don't really talk about what the mechanism is. And it could be any one of those three mechanisms. They don't really hang their hat on any one of those. I agree. It could be any one of those. I agree, but my... my the, where I get nihilistic on this is, Don't is get that nihilistic. I, <laughs> or nihilistic. Uh, nihilistic, even uh, or, worse. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? I think so. Uh, I, I never knew. Um, I think it's nihilistic, like Neil Young. Yeah. Um, That's exactly what it is, Chris. Yeah. Exactly what yeah. it is. Rust, Rust lives. Go ahead. Live rest. Continue. Um, so, uh, you know, if I were if I were curious about this relationship, and clearly um, you're not. And, uh, no, no, I, <laughs> I think it's a great question. Like, you know, could could exercise have this fantastic ancillary benefit? Um, the truth is that I I would not try to test it in a cross sectional study because exactly. I don't think it will give me an answer that actually answers the question. And- and right. there, and there, and, and so that's where I want to take this next, which is I think we all have some serious skepticism about not necessarily the hypothesis, which I, you know, I theoretically could believe there is some effect sure. I, doubling, twofold increase, and that's you know you lose really, me at that yeah. point. Who knows? But is there mm-hmm. something going on? Uh, potentially something going on that's also mixed in with these confounding effects, these other things that are going ashore. So the question is, how would you do a better study? I mean, how would you actually get at this particular effect? And I mean, is there any reason why you couldn't? Trial this as a randomized control trial. Uh, oh, no, God, actually, would, this would be that would be devilishly would be, hard. I think it would Why? be hard to do, but yeah. it could be done. Why it could be done? Because you have to cohort them. I mean, you could you could set these kids up for for like maybe different kinds of exercise. If you thought it was unethical, for example, not to enroll the kids all the kids in some exercise program, perhaps you could put them into like a program that is sort of like weight training versus aerobic. And they're making a very specific claim about aerobic exercise uh-huh. based on this fit because that's the thing that this this test this fitness gram. Um, you know, it's supposed to be measuring. Yeah, the pacer. Okay, the pacer, right. The so pacer. it is not measuring other forms of, of athleticism. So That's if strange. you wanted to narrow the question, say, does aerobic exercise specifically do this? You could randomize people to different kinds of exercise. You could do it that way. Yep. Okay, you'd have to follow them for quite some time, I think. Uh, years, years. Yeah, so that's where that's where I have a maybe, problem. maybe. I, that's where I mean, I, there are some that, there are some hypotheses that that suggest that some of the other studies that they cite that suggest there are short term effects that there are, you know, exercising before doing an exam actually improves your score on the exam. That's, that's true. possibly I, I, true. That's a good point. I'm kind of skeptical of how much of an effect that would actually have, but I'm saying there are things you could do. Is my point, and I don't think. But with but with this biological evidence that in fact there are structural changes 
one would imagine that those structural changes would take time sure. to actually happen, and they would be probably very specific to a particular age group. So sure. I, you'd have to you'd have to really cut down the age groups and the strata that you would do a prospective study in that I think would make it really difficult. If in fact those are the underlying causes, absolutely. If it's increased brain, you know, oxygenation of the of the brain because you're more fit, then maybe maybe you could sure. on a short term basis. I also think you could do this as a better observational study. You could you could set this up as a cohort study longitudinally. You could collect data on those concerns that you have about factors that are imbalanced between the groups and do a really well done cohort study. So I don't think this is an unanswerable question. I just think we don't have the evidence in front of us to suggest that there is, in fact, a causal link at the moment. And would a well-designed cohort study ever really prove that this was the case? I, no. Well, no. Why not? What, what would the cohort no. study have to include to, to say that we had satisfactorily adjusted for all of these potential conf- confounders. conventional major confounders? Resources, uh, parenting, you know, environment, school quality, sure, you know, academic track within the school, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things. Okay, and then also the the intrinsic, you know, factor of the child, these different children. So, Matt, you're saying that I think you you're, get you're a saying of theoretically that? it's possible, but practically speaking, do you really think that we could, what one could design a study that would be that comprehensive prospectively? I do I it with don't. with with resources. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone's ever going to put the resources to that. Well, yeah, I mean that's 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 sort of what the, the catchphrase. You can always say that if there are unlimited resources. I don't mean unlimited, but I think you know you would need a you would need a you know this have to do this like a large uh, NIH study, which I don't think. Anyone's going to put the research. I mean, why did they do this study in the first place? Part of the reason they did, I mean, presumably they had they had a hypothesis, but the other reason is this data already existed. And right. so they could get the data and run with the the study and try to figure out what was going on. The interesting thing is you mentioned that they were taking advantage of, of what was going on in Nebraska. I mean, this goes on everywhere, right? Everyone, I, I, my kids do the PACER and my kids get academic scores. So you could do this study repeated, you know, you could do this all over the country, but I'm guessing you would repeat the same mistakes that I think are are potentially going on here. So. One thing I'd like to uh, just just yep. take take a second to try to figure out is I don't know if you guys saw this on Table Three. I know we're not supposed to re- be um, referring to tables, but it's the table where they look at the math scores by the various different categories and they break it down by fitness and boys and girls and grade level, and then you get to middle school, and what happens? The estimates go way wonky on middle school. Uh-huh. I, I don't understand. The, I mean, the, I don't that, understand why that is. Other than that, every met, child have you met gets, a middle school gets kid? Into middle school is nothing but trouble. Oh. But it just stands out on this table where mm-hmm. the estimates are like way wacky. What yeah. is that about? That's middle school kids. I know, no, no. But what, in, I in got terms two of, reading, of them right now. In They're terms fantastic of reading the kids. Table, but this jives with my experience. So what is it? What is it telling us? It's telling well, us that middle school is, is has a has a a much stronger correlation. Well, when do they start to teach the test aggressively in, in Nebraska? Is the question. Um, my guess is it's probably in middle school. And so when you're looking at the primary school that's, kids, that's purely a guess. That that's just a guess. But I'm just saying. <laughs> Speculation, that's, Your that's Honor. That's a theory. That's Speculate. a theory that this All is right. this is when they start we'll to teach the test. We'll accept it. And that you're seeing, you know. No, but look at those numbers. Pass I mean, the they're NISA just test. wacky now numbers. All right. Can I can I end can I end with a. Uh, with some uh, some some thoughts that I had on this paper, as how uh, even though this study was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, it is uh, noticeably different from your typical uh, Journal of Pediatrics Journal study. of Pediatrics paper, medical paper in gen, you know uh, uh, public health or medical studies, and I, I was just sort of jotting down my thoughts. Um, for Jog- one, jogging thing, down your thoughts. Jogging. I went jogging with <laughs> some thoughts aerobically. <laughs> That's why he remembered them. That's oh, exactly. Oh, oh, so you buy just, the theory. You do. I'm, I'm totally sold. You are totally sold. This is why uh, we're getting no reviews. It's because of all these corny jokes. Oh, so the education the literature I think is very different from the from the way that we in epidemiology are taught. So for one thing, this is very hypothesis testing heavy. It's very much focused on p values and not on estimating the size of these your effects. Your favorites. Yep. Um, there is. Uh, a huge overlap in this paper between the discussion and the results. Much of the results are discussion, which nothing wrong with that, but that's just not what the way we're sort of trained to do things. Uh, no, did you guys notice there's no ethics statement? I know. No, no, you know, our the, we had this reviewed by an, our uh, an it's ethics probably board. probably exempt. It might have been, but you would think they would say study. that. You would think they would say that. or I mean, they, they had data. Presumably they had to get it anonymized before they could – Analyze it without, you know, anyway, uh, just thought it was interesting that there was no statement to say it was exempt. Um, it's really heavy on correlation as opposed to estimation of, of the size of these effects. Um, they've got uh, p-values in their baseline table, which is something that we generally don't do in, in epidemiology. There are no, there's not a single, as far as I could tell, a single confidence interval in this paper anywhere. 
Uh, it's very much focused on uh, explaining variance, which is something that we do in in uh, in regression modeling, but not really when we're looking at effects. Um, they used an odds ratio for a very common outcome, which is kind of a, a bit of a, a no-no because it tends to overstate effects. Um, and they focused on p-values for deciding what to put in their model. And uh, the thing that uh, just gets me those, they put stars for things that were statistically significant, which just drives me a little <laughs> bit batty. Okay. Well, well, you prefer two stars? Uh, five stars for the podcast, but generally leave the stars out and just well, estimation. Well, I'd like to add just to, to that. Is it like, I thought Go for it. You're, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the discussion yep. um, and it's sort of a little bit unorthodox uh, style. Very, and, very light on limitations as well. Uh, yeah, they, they kind of glossed over that, I'd say. Um, but I was struck by the whole first paragraph of the discussion, which leads with this sentence. And I'll just read it to the readers because yeah, they can't great. see the paper. Because entering the yep. Pacers uh, HFZ, which is the healthy fit zone. Healthy fit zone. Healthy fit zone. Because entering the Pacers HFZ was associated with ac- was associated with academic outcomes, we suggest that school systems use the Pacer as a standalone measure of aerobic fitness. It's 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 an amazingly it's a product plug in in the first line of the discussion section. It's also an amazingly strong statement for what is what is you know observational. S- uh, data. observational, but it's just it's it's not great data for trying to draw the kinds of conclusions that they are trying to draw, and they I mean they clearly if you scan this I did sort of skin it, the number of times the word effect is in there. Yeah. Not association, effect, which is making a statement that we believe it's these causality. are causally related is way too much. I, I mean, it shouldn't be in there at all, of course, if, if, if we don't believe that these are effects. But uh, yeah, I, I had some trouble with that. Certainly not as the first sentence of the discussion. No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And it also does not matter that the pacer is a better, a better uh, measure of fitness than the timed mile. I mean, th- like the whole paragraph goes off in this weird tangent about different ways of the best way of measuring aerobic fitness. I'm with you. None of which is presented in, the, in this paper at all. You know, so it's like typically when you get to the discussion, you say, you know, in conclusion, we found blah, 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 blah. And we therefore think this is important because of why, yep. you know, um, but that's... So you think, you think these people are being controlled by a big pacer? I don't know. I mean, it's just so weird that they yeah. went straight into a product plug yeah. for I, this, I, this product by the, the Cooper Institute. I, was, I, I, I didn't have the same reaction to the product placement so much as the conclusion I think was unjustified. Yeah. But anyway. Well, all I right. I agree with you there. Uh, so I think we are, it's fair to say, we're all open to the idea that this... Theoretically, there could be a, a, an effect, but that we don't have any evidence of it from this study. It has not moved my needle. It has well. That's that's pretty hard to do. All right. <laughs> um, in that case, let's move on to our uh, second segment. In our second segment, we are going to go back to a phrase that a listener has pointed out. Chris has said repeatedly in the earlier versions of the podcast. Uh, and I've heard you say it, and I haven't had a chance to to thoroughly grill you and question you on it. But you essentially said it again. Uh, more or less here. Well, you didn't say it quite as strongly this time, which is that you can't infer causation from observational studies. So by observational studies, we mean studies in which the investigators don't do anything to the, to the, to the, uh, or change the course of the, the intervention that the it's not an experiment. participants are getting. There's no experiment. We simply observe people according to the things that they do. So, so in this case, they didn't go in and train kids uh, in terms of to, to, to increase their aerobic fitness levels. They simply looked at whether kids had a particular aerobic fitness level and then looked at their outcomes and there was no intervention. So you have said observational studies you cannot infer causation from. And uh, as our listener points out, uh, if that were the case, uh, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase the way they've said it. Uh, would you suggest then we should all begin uh, smoking and going and working uh, in asbestos factories because clearly we can infer a causation from the observational studies that showed that both smoking and asbestos increase the risk for lung cancer. Okay. Chris, go. Okay, all right. So Weren't those interventional studies? Those yeah, were no, not. They they were were not, not yeah. Nobody was didn't, randomized didn't to smoke. Didn't we randomize people to uh, being exposed to asbestos? I'm right. pretty sure well, they did not. we did. I will start with making the... the uh, um, sweeping generalization. The sweeping oh, generalization. Now, fantastic. I'm going to start by pointing out the ironic fact that, um, that, uh, that Fisher was one of the ones who uh, is famous for saying... Uh, correlation does not equal causation. Fish, Fisher, Fisher as being? in the Fisher's exact tech, right. the guy who invented the ANOVA. So, the invented the, and modern the, the statistics, p-value, basically. The p-value, right. Hypothesis testing all goes back to, what was it, E. Fisher? E.A. Fisher? R.A. Fisher. R.A. Fisher, thank you. Um, he was a British statistician. And, uh, you know, he was an expert witness for the tobacco industry. Were you aware of this? I and was. Fought hard against the theory that tobacco causes... 
uh, smoking. Do you know what his, what his alternative hypothesis was? Uh, no, please tell. That it was a genetic factor, that he proposed there would be a, a genetic factor that both predisposed you to smoke a type A personality type thing. Oh, my God. And would also uh, lead to a propensity you to smoke. You can't be correct all the time, you know? So of all the ironic things... Uh, sorry, a propensity towards lung of, cancer. Of all the ironic me. things to be wrong about... Um, that's that's a, uh, a great start. That's, that's, that is our... a great <laughs> anecdote, but I don't see what it has to do with your point. Okay, so I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna back off a little bit on, okay, on my good. statement, saying that you cannot say what I am going to say is is that it is very difficult from the math to prove causality from the math. From Meaning the what math. math? What's so the math? The, the actual numbers that we crunch and the data we generate that in order to to make a strong inference of causality, you generally need to have some external information that provides context. I'll give you a simple example. Okay. okay. I like simple. Case control study. Okay. You got the people who went to the BU spring picnic, uh, the School of Public Health spring c- picnic, and they ate jello salad or potato salad I or know chicken the salad. This, it's always the potato salad. It's always, always the potato salad. So some people got salmonella food poisoning and some didn't and you're like and you do the case control study and he was like and it turns out it was the potato salad you're it's absolutely always right the potato salad you're, I know you're this. on the money you've heard yep. this story it's, it's always, the, always potato the potato salad so potato salad has a unique you know a strong association with food poisoning um and we could say well as a case control study we can't assume causality but in this case we cannot reasonably claim that salmonella causes consumption of potato salad so the reverse interpretation is very likely correct <laughs> Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You are, you are dealing with one and only one problem with observational studies there, which is reverse causation. Okay. That instead of the exposure causing the outcome, the outcome causes the exposure. But we also have okay, the confounding I've, problems, the selection bias problem, and the mismeasurement problems. And I, I'm, I'm citing this as an example where there are clearly instances where you can for causality because the reverse hypothesis is I know, but it's strange that I'm pushing so... you on the part where you're actually backing off for some reason. Okay. I know, because I'm going to ask you to wind it, wind it up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because I'm pushing it Go back ahead. on you, Matt. Go ahead. And Go so, ahead. you know, and so then there are more elaborate designs. So we went and get to the cohort studies where we started measuring all these factors prospectively. And we have studied, we have reviewed a number of cohort studies on this show where we basically came to the conclusion that despite the elegant math, we couldn't quite persuade ourselves it was true. Those are a handful of examples, but maybe we could look at some broader examples where like, you know, we have decades of very, very fine epidemiologic research showing that high cholesterol levels are the causal like, factor you know, going with this. leading to heart attacks. And, 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 and yet now suddenly the sand is shifting on us. We're no longer quite sure whether there's a causal relationship between the cholesterol, that it turns out that perhaps the biology is a wee bit more subtle than that. Yeah. You know, and so, and then we've got like decades of, of examples where we, observational studies show that hormone replacement. Replacement therapy, therapy was a significant <laughs> yeah. Yeah. protective effect on cardiovascular disease demolished in one randomized control trial. I feel like we, so, we are going to go to the progesterone <laughs> well one too many times on, to, this, I know. on this podcast, uh-huh. but I will allow it this time. Uh-huh. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say okay. that there have been a number yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of instances where we have got it spectacularly wrong because we were so sure of the, of the fidelity of our cohort studies. Agreed, agreed. But does that mean that you can't infer causation from observational studies? We have... Uh, the, 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 the smoking and lung cancer and the asbestos and lung cancer are just a, a couple of examples. Don, I think you've got some, some others that you and I were chatting about. That- yeah, the diethyl stilbestrol, which, which, um, is a, is a, an, an associ- which has been shown to have an association with um, cervical cancer in women. That was, that was one because cervical cancer in women um, at the time was considered. I thought it was adenocarcinoma. It was adeno, but anyway. adenocarcinoma. adenocarcinoma. Adeno, the yeah, vagina. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You're right. Adenocarcinoma of the vagina. Which a lot of work has been done here at PU. That's, 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 is that right? Colleagues, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. So a very rare occurrence, but you need to do a case control study to, to show that. And I, I think that's generally accepted. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so this is a, the Tom Frieden. Uh, former, former? Is he a former. fan of the pod? Director of the CDC. I don't know. We're going to send it. I mentioned his name. So I, people like he when, should be now. We should people, tweet him. People like when they talk. He put, he put out a paper uh, in the New England Journal this year. I believe it was this year in August called Evidence for Health Decision Making Beyond Randomized Controlled Trials. And he goes through every possible design that you could, you could think of and lists examples of cases where. We got it wrong. Uh, no, we, we got, got, it, got right. it right. Oh, oh gosh. Where observational studies or. Trials, or even in some cases, uh, case series, you know, with no comparison effects of cross sectional studies, uh, sodium and blood pressure, uh, ecologic studies, vaccine effectiveness uh, have 
been uh, highly useful. Uh, program-based evidence, the the Back to Sleep campaign in New Zealand, a lot of different... Male, male circumcision and HIV heterosexual transmission. Uh, so that was a tricky lot, one. There was a lot of observational That's, work that that, sh- that indicated that that, that was the case. And then there were, there were Yet two... Yet we had to there prove were it two, with randomized control trials. There were two trials. randomized control trials that were ended early. So, I agree. I mean, so it goes both ways. I agree. So it's obviously not... No one's saying that because it's not a visual study, it can't be true. I, I think you were. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that. It's what I'm it not sounded that. like. No, that's, I'm that's saying... That's why we wanted you to have a chance to clarify. I am saying that we have to be very careful with observational studies because we are limited in our ability to draw the inferences about causality. Fair enough. Don't we have to be careful when we look at randomized trials as well? Of course well? we do. We always have to be careful. Okay. We always so have to be careful say, all the why time. Have you never said on this podcast, this data came from a randomized trial and we can't trust randomized trials. Have we done any randomized control trials? We I have. Think, I think oh, we did the, the some, hockey study. We, was that our RCT? No, that wasn't an RCT. We did the we did the uh, Uganda one. And oh, that then, was a great study. It, <laughs> I think he's become a hostile witness. I think it is time <laughs> to move on now that we have Pull confidently the cozy, pop yeah. it over his head. Now that we have determined that in fact there are times we just have to think for ourselves. Okay. So let's move on to so our So I, I want oh, I'm going to push you. You were the one who wanted, who was winding it up. So let's let's bring it back. I just gave you like six examples. That's Tom Friedman's examples. Well, I'm, I have no originality myself. My my only feeling is well-designed observational studies can can in fact and in fact you know what's most interesting is if you look at the um, the, the 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 hormone replacement therapy example, uh, Miguel Hernan did a fantastic paper in which he reanalyzed the nurses' health study data. So that's the observational data that that much of that recommendation was based on. Analyzed it in a way that you would have done for the randomized trial. So developed a, a, a protocol very similar, included similar patients, uh, and showed almost the same results and showed that actually it isn't necessarily that we completely got it wrong. It's much more that we actually were looking at very different populations and the effects may be very different in younger women than in older women. Uh, so I don't actually know that the the the, progest- the, the, the hormone replacement therapy example is 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 so much proof that we uh, we can't get the right answer from observational studies so much as we have to think differently about how we do. Fair enough. All right. So, I think uh, I'm going to declare victory on that one, and I, I think say that we up. won. No, I think we won. Uh, so let's move on to our last segment, our amazing and amusing. So this is where we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do. A look at the uh, weird and wacky stuff that goes on in our field. Don, what do you got for us this time? Well, because we had so much fun on uh, discussing that last paper, I've picked a paper that's somewhat similar. Well the, done. The title of this paper is Role of Childhood Aerobic Fitness in Successful Street Crossing. Say what now? By Laura Chaddock, Mark Nider, Aubrey Lutz, S- Charles Hillman, and car- Arthur so the, Kramer. So how fit you are determines, determines whether how or not successful you, get- you can walk across the street. And define success. Hit by a car or you just well, get they, stuck in the middle of the road? They set up a whole trial. So and you what have to they be did, rescued. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. So what they did is they... Um, Built a a virtual street intersection. You gotta be kidding me! And they they got um, I love it. Thirteen higher fit and thirteen lower fit children, eight to ten year olds, boys and girls. Okay. And they put them in this virtual <laughs> environment on a treadmill with like you know they, VR glasses and oh stuff. Boy. And then they played this 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 um, like street farther. scene, and they would have them cross the street so multiple times. No actual children were harmed in with, the making of this study. Ca- well, now apparently a bunch of them got hit by cars in but the vir- virtual, virtual, correct, virtually. correct, <laughs> virtual car crashes. And, the, and, and so what they did is they had cars going through this virtual scene, and they had the kids either. Walk across this virtual <laughs> intersection, <laughs> um, completely who undistracted. Who, who? Then the second group, they the the second uh, trial was that they would be listening to music of their own nice. choice. Yep. And the third one would be that they would be talking on the phone with a friend. And they found that um, cell phones impaired street co- street crossing success rates compared with the undistracted or music conditions for all participants. Um, wow. and, but they found that the higher fit children maintained cro- cross, crossing street success rates across all three conditions, whereas the unfit children didn't. So they were able to run and avoid the cars. They were, yeah, they were, they were able in this virtual scenario not to get hit by cars, not to trip on the curbs. <laughs> trip. Yeah. That's another problem. That was a part of it. 
Got it. So anyway, what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of like take a second to explore this whole concept of smartphone zombies. Smartphone zombies. Which is an actual term. Yep. I think that's an actual, I, I definitely go into that And it's now being recognized as a serious problem all over the world. And in fact, there are cities such as Chongqing, I think is how you pronounce Chongqing. it. Chongqing. Yep. Um, and Antwerp, which have built special Lane it's on the road. For people? <laughs> for people to walk along. Oh, to walk. walk. I thought it was to drive no, while, no, no, while no. looking no, at your cell phone. <laughs> while, they're, while, they're, while they're fussing Special, with their cell phones. I have seen, so I have seen that there are places where that have Smart signs lines. on the ground well, before yes. you cross. Augsburg and Cologne have ground level traffic lights embedded in the pavement. That is so smart. So smart. And the, Why? And there's apparently Why? an app which uses the phone's camera to make it seem as if the phone <laughs> is transparent. <laughs> So that they don't have to look up. Ah, it makes so much sense. Uh, we anyway. definitely want to make the world easier for people to stare at their cell phones. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, Chris, top that one. No, I, there's there's no way I'm going to be able to beat that. But yeah, we need to we need to start getting you to go last, yeah. <laughs> so that Chris and I can uh, have some pride. Yeah, <laughs> pride in the, in our weirdness. Well, I found a, a an interesting article in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences. Uh, by Bornstein and colleagues called The Neurobiology of Culturally Common Maternal Responses to Infant Cry. Okay, neurobiological responses to of mothers to their infant cry. Right. Their infant? Their, their, uh, their in infant? this case, it, was, it actually was recordings of their, of their infants crying. Their own infants. Yeah, and now, so there's, a, there's kind of an interesting backstory to this, which is, is uh, um, uh, evolutionary. So um, you, you've probably all seen the you know the the March of the Emperor Penguins uh, movie oh, where yeah. they got the baby penguins who like squeak and in yeah. particular unique ways that to us sound like every other baby penguin on the beach, but the mom penguin can find that baby penguin. Of course, and among so, ten thousand, amongst ten right on this rookery in the middle of some snowstorm at minus rookery. fifty degrees centigrade. I never been to a rookery. So um, the the there are, are powerful sort of evolutionary deep, deep brain pathways that um, allow mothers to identify their children by sound oh. okay? and to respond to them. And so, um, you know, and, and there's, there was a couple brilliant examples here where they talk about deer. This is just from their discussion section, but I thought it was beautiful where it's like deer, mother deer will approach a, a, a speaker hidden in the grass, mm -hmm. you know, like a little uh, bow speaker hidden in the grass that, um, As you find in that the plays the, the distressed vocalizations of baby deer, of, of course. Her baby deer or of any, any baby, baby deer? deer. Okay, so it's, it. it's like a, it's a much broader evolutionary phenomenon that mothers will respond to the distressed sounds of infants. Would she respond to a, another animal? And so, yes, in fact, it turns out that they will respond to the sounds of, of taped infant marmots, seals, domestic cats, bats, I, humans, and other mammals. Especially taped ones. Other yeah. than baby deer. <laughs> so it is a, it's a much more generalizable phenomenon. That, that, uh, That's amazing. That so, yeah, it was cool. fascinating. So, so they did this sort of experiment using functional MRI uh, to, uh, to look at this, this uh, prospectively. Um, and, and, and they did a whole series of, of analyses looking at um, uh, the response of um, uh, mothers in multiple different countries around the world. And this is where the cultural context comes in because they wanted to see are these like universal responses or are these like US centric or Asia centric responses that our moms are somehow biologically different. Turns out that we're not. We are really very similar wherever we are on the planet. And when they they would play like a sound of an infant crying versus some control noise, like an infant babbling or just some random noise, that the moms would respond very stereotypical ways. And they mm. measured different behaviors from them. And one of the universal behaviors that was seen across all these different countries is that when they hear hear the sound of their infant crying, they would stop whatever they're doing and they would go pick up the baby and try to soothe it. And they would talk to it as opposed to other behaviors like try to give them some food or try to distract them by shaking a rattle or, or to sort of nurture them in some ways like changing a nappy that the sound of the crying baby made them want to pick up the baby and talk to it. Yeah. And, and I thought this was fascinating. And then they did functional MRI and found that there are very specific parts of the brain that light up in response to infant cry that mm. are distinct from like an infant babble or the sound of a, you know, a car horn. Huh. Um, I, I thought this was just really, really interesting cool. to sort of think how hardwired maternal instincts are pretty cool uh, across the species and over the millennia. And if they were aerobically fit, yeah, it would totally. They would get there it. faster. <laughs> yeah, much faster. As long as they didn't have to get through traffic. That's right. All right. Well, uh, that would be a great experiment, by the way. I'm not, the no. sound of the infant across the the, the Route 95. 
So, so a combination of aerobic fitness and speed crossing. They have to like the <laughs> sprints <laughs> with the with the virtual reality headset. I with the virtual reality headset on, <laughs> wearing their headphones, <laughs> their, their iPod. All right, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, so for for mine, I went back to the uh, the British Medical Journal Christmas edition because it's one of my oh yeah one of my favorites. We love it. Uh, and uh, there's an article from 2000, 2015, which uh, deals with a problem that I find myself dealing with way too often, which is you you do your study and you write up the results, you send it off to the journal for publication, and you get back that letter that says, "We thank you for your submission." Uh, unfortunately, volumes of submissions are high, and at this time, we cannot publish your paper. Thank you very much. The rejection letter, which we all deal with. Uh, and they have come up with a, a pretty great solution to the rejection letter problem, which is called the rejection of rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> and so they've got a letter that you can just fill in the blanks here, and then you, you send this back to the journal, and it goes as follows. So you say, dear professor, insert name of editor, Thank you for your rejection of the above manuscript. Unfortunately, we are not able to accept it at this time. As you're probably aware, we receive many rejections each year, and we are simply not able to accept all of them. In fact, with increasing pressure on citation rates and fiercely competitive funding structures, we typically accept fewer than 30% of rejections we receive. Please don't take this as a reflection of your work. The standard of some of the rejections we receive is very high. In terms of the specific factors influencing our decision, the, fa the failure of Assessor 1 to realize the brilliance of the study was certainly one of them. <laughs> Simply stating this study is neither novel nor interesting and does not, extend, does not extend knowledge in this area is not reason enough. <laughs> this, coupled with the use of Latin quotes by Assessor 2, rendered an acceptance of your rejection extremely unlikely. I will leave it there. <laughs> but I just think that is a, a brilliant concept that we don't need to accept our rejections. It's worth a try. We can reject. Oh, and I will say they, they end it by saying... Um, we look forward to receiving the proofs and to working with you in the future. Yours sincerely, insert name here, and then they say, insert university here, insert country here. That is Australia slash New Zealand slash small European country slash Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Makes total Very sense. Good, Matt. Makes I, I total love that. sense. Good for the BMJ. I'm a big fan of the BMJ's Christmas they are, edition. They are spectacular. And the by the way, product plug, let's go Santa. He's coming soon. Santa is coming yeah. soon. Yeah. Watch out for it. All right. Next month. How come, how come that paper couldn't end with a product plug, but we can end the podcast with a product plug? That's right. Uh, yeah. Double standard. Yeah. All right. So that's it. Uh, we've come to the end of the program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, as we did in this particular episode, you can tweet us at pophealthex, or you can tweet me at Prof Matt Fox, or Chris at ID Doc Gil. Gil. Or Don, you, you've been reinstated on Twitter? I've been reinstated, yes. Dthea1. Uh, at Dthea1. Or, what did you do to get booted yeah, off yeah. the Twitter? Oh, no, I, I didn't get booted off the Twitter. Sure you didn't. No, no, no. I got blocked by one person, then I I, uh, I closed yeah. my account and had to re resurrect it a month later. That's you, the way Twitter works. Who, who, uh, I'm not going to ask who you got blocked by. Uh, so, Or you can, uh, find this, uh, uh, you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website. That's www.pophealthyx.org. I want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you download our next episode. <laughs> <laughs>